Hi, friends, and happy Sunday. I'm so glad that you could join with me this morning as we continue in our series, Looking at Hope. Now, I have a confession to make. I have a tendency in my life that when things aren't going my way or when things feel out of control, I have the tendency to step in and try to take control of the situation. Now, sometimes this can be a good thing. For example, when I look out my window and I see that the grass is getting too long, I take control of the situation and I get outside and I mow the lawn. And that can be a good thing. Or at other times when I notice that a relationship that I have with something, with someone isn't going well, I'll go out of my way and I'll put in the extra time and effort to try and mend that relationship. However, even though it can sometimes be good in my life, There are many times that it has created problems for me. You see, sometimes what I think is good and what I think should happen can put me in conflict with what other people think is good and what they think should happen. For example, in the morning when my wife and I get up and we make our bed and I notice that there's more blankets on my side of the bed than on hers, well, in the wintertime, I'm okay with that. I want to keep warm. Of course, she's not too happy with me. But right now, as the seasons are changing and as the temperature is getting warmer, I don't want those extra blankets. She can have them. Of course, now that it's warmer, she doesn't want them either. And so I find myself in conflict trying to get my own way. Now, this is just a small example, but it also happens in the bigger things of life as well. And I think that it's something that all of us struggle with. We put our wants and our desires over the wants and desires of other people. And even when we put others first, let's be honest, many of us are keeping score. We're keeping track saying, hey, okay, fine. This time you can have what you want, but next time, next time I get to choose. Next time I get my way. And as I mentioned about myself before, and I think it's true of all of us, When things start to feel like they're more chaotic, when things start to feel like they're out of control, we tend to want to step up more and try to take control. And because of COVID-19, a lot of us are really feeling like things are out of control right now. We can't get together with our friends and family like we normally would. And we're dearly missing each other, right? We can't go out for a meal. We can't go out and have fun like going to the movie theaters, going bowling, or even going to our provincial and national parks right now. Uh, Many of us wish that we could go to work, but we can't. We've been laid off. We don't have a job to go to right now because our place of business has been shut down because of the coronavirus. And so many of us are feeling those financial pressures. However, there are other people who, because they work in an essential service, They have to go to work even if they don't want to. And there are many people who are afraid to go to work for fear of getting sick and bringing the coronavirus home to their own families. So much is not going our way right now. It's not how we would like it. And so we may find ourselves doing something, anything, just to feel like there is some semblance of control in our lives. Unfortunately, at this time, We're also, at least many of us, are stuck at home with our families. And so as we fight for control, as we fight to get what we want, we end up find ourselves in conflict with other people in our families as they also try to get what they want. Friends, this is a terrible thing. We don't want to be in conflict. We don't want to hurt those who are closest to us. But even worse than all of that, When we fight for control in our lives, we end up hurting God. We end up finding ourselves at odds in our relationship with God. And that's our biggest problem because as we saw last week, God is our source of hope. And he is the one who is in control, working everything to draw us closer to himself. So what can we do to stop being at odds with God and with others? And instead, how can we find hope in our relationship with Jesus? Well, that's the question that we are going to explore this morning. 
Now this series on hope is based on a couple of verses found in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verses 13 and 14, God says, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Now we're looking at these verses because what they say about a lack of rain and locusts and plague is eerily similar to what we are going through in our world today. If you don't know or can't remember how these disasters relate to today, aside from the obvious coronavirus, uh, please go and check out part one of this series um, where we started by looking at verse 13 and the reality that God is in control and he will do anything to draw us into a closer relationship with him. But as we turn our attention to what we're talking about today, it's important for us to remember that these verses are about our relationship with God. They are about our relationship with God. And because we find hope in our relationship with God, it's extremely important for us to listen to what God says to us through these verses. And so we are going to explore the first thing that God asks for his people to do. After mentioning the many disasters that can befall us, God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. That's right. We are going to look at humility. When we think of humility, we often think of putting others first making the good of others a higher priority in our lives than our own wants and desires. And that matches up with what God tells us through the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Philippians. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of of the others. Now this is great advice and wisdom that God gives us for our relationships with one another. When we're with other people, we want to have good relationships, right? We and so we need to push ourselves. We need to push ourselves to be concerned about the needs and the desires of others because when we consider other people's needs and they consider ours, We end up wanting to be with each other and we end up wanting to have good relationships, which is for our own good. But what about in our relationship with God? What does humility look like as we relate to the God of the universe? Because let's be honest, we can always get away from other people. We can always withdraw from them and get apart on our own so that we can do what we want to do. But God is always with us. And because God is always with us, that means that our humility in our relationship with him is 24-7. So what does that look like to have humility in our relationship with God? Well, when it comes to our relationship with the divine, humility starts with recognizing that God is God and we are not. Right? God is God. He is the one who is truly in control and we are not. Therefore, it's saying that if we're going to put God first, making what God wants a higher priority in our lives than what we want, then we are to be obedient to him. We are to submit our wills to the will of God. We are to think, say, and do what God wants us to think, say, and do. There's one word that kind of summarizes what this idea is all about, and that word is servant. We are to be God's servants. Now again, I know that this is not a popular sentiment, and who am I, uh, a white guy, to talk about slavery and being a servant, but I'm not talking about the kind of slavery that we usually think about. 
I'm not talking about slavery that we can think about in the recent history in North America and across the world. I'm talking about being servants and slaves of God, servants of the one who made us and who loves us and who even died for us. Remember Jesus, he is God and he came and he died to set us free from sin and fear and death. And so we're not talking about slavery in general, but about being a servant of God. Now, I looked through my Bible and I tried to rack my brain to find a story of what this could look like, a a story of how this was lived out, aside from, of course, Jesus and his relationship with God the Father. And you know what? The best example that I could find was actually in an old obscure law found in the Old Testament. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses, who is the leader of the Israelites, is going over the laws and the regulations that God had outlined and given to the Hebrews, to the Israelite people. Um, We have all of those laws written down in the books of Exodus and Leviticus. But here in Deuteronomy, Moses is recounting all of the laws for the Israelites as they are getting ready to go in and take possession of the land that God had promised them. Now in chapter 15, God reminds them about freeing their fellow Israelites, uh, those who had sold themselves to being their servants because of the debts that they owed. You see, back then it wasn't like it is today. Today, if we find ourselves in too much debt, if things get out of control, many of us can just declare bankruptcy, right? We can go through debt consolidation, figure out the details, pay what we can, and then our debts are wiped out. They're forgiven. But back in those times, if somebody found themselves in debt, The only thing that they could do to pay off their debts was to literally sell themselves as a slave to the person that they owed in order to work off the money that they owed. And so because of that, slavery was a common thing. It didn't look the way that we think it does, but it was a very common thing. But because of God's heart for his people... God outlines certain rules and regulations to make sure that it doesn't get out of hand. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 12, Moses tells or reminds the people of God's law when he says, If any of your people, Hebrew men or women, sell themselves to you and serve you for six years, in the seventh year you must let them go free. Now we're going to see in just a little bit that this was not a popular notion. However, God cared deeply for his people and he always provided a way out, a way that was good for his people. Well, Moses goes on to say, And when you release them, do not send them away empty-handed. Supply them liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Give to them as the Lord your God has blessed you. In other words, while they have been working for you for the past six years in order to pay off their debts, you are now to care for their needs and supply them generously so that when they go free, that they don't have to just turn around and resell themselves back into slavery because they can't And they don't have a way of making a living. They have nothing for themselves. And so God told the Israelites to provide for their servants when they set them free so that they can get back on their feet again and have their independence. But why should the Israelites be so benevolent towards their servants? Well, Moses tells us. He says, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. God's command to the Israelites to free their servants after six years of work is a reflection of God's heart and his care for his people as shown in him releasing the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. This is God's heart. He wants to free his people. 
He wants to provide for them. He wants to care for them and help them to have the best life possible. But like I said earlier, it, this was not a popular notion. You see, hundreds of years later, when the Israelites were under attack because they had been disobedient to God and they would eventually be taken into exile in Assyria and in Babylon, the prophet Jeremiah spoke the words of God to the Israelites. And he said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I made a covenant with your ancestors when I brought them out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. I said, every seventh year, each of you must free any fellow Hebrews who have sold themselves to you. After they have served you six years, you must let them go free. Jeremiah is referring to the law that we just looked at back in Deuteronomy chapter 15. But he goes on to say, your ancestors, however, did not listen to me or pay attention to me. None of the ancestors, none of the previous generations followed this law. Not a single one of them, right? None of them listened to God and set their Hebrew servants free after six years. Why? Because they were selfish, right? Why would you set a servant free when a servant is an extreme value to you? A servant can help you make more money. A servant can make your life a whole lot easier. And so the Israelites didn't actually listen and obey the law of God. And if we were to read further on in Jeremiah chapter 34, we would see that Jeremiah goes on to accuse that very generation that he's speaking to of the exact same thing, that they themselves were not following this law. And so because they never followed this law, we actually have no examples of what this law lived out looks like. Which means we also don't have any examples of what the extension or continuation of this law looks like. You see, back in Deuteronomy chapter 15, after outlining the law of freeing an Israelite servant after six years of service, Moses goes on to say, But if your servant says to you, I do not want to leave you because he loves you and your family and is well off with you, then take an awl and push it through his earlobe into the door, and he will become your servant for life. And do the same for your female servants as well. Now an awl is a small pointed tool uh, typically used for punching holes in leather working. And so if a servant wanted to stay being a servant to a master that they loved, they would have their ear pierced by this awl by pushing it through their earlobe into the doorpost. And this was a physical declaration of the choice that the servant has made to stay a servant. Now, if the Israelites had actually followed this law, we might have an example or two in our Bibles of what this relationship between a master, a good master, and a servant who chose to stay a servant might have looked like. But they didn't follow the law of God, and so we don't have any examples. And so I think for many of us, we just can't comprehend choosing to stay a servant when offered our freedom. But when life is so much better under the care and the protection of a good master, why wouldn't we stay? Right? Why wouldn't you want all of your needs provided for? Why wouldn't you want a good life and to live in a nice house instead of scratching in the dirt trying to make a living? Why wouldn't you want to stay with people who love and appreciate you? Friends, although we don't have any examples The theoretical relationship between a good master and a servant who loves his master is a beautiful picture of our relationship with God. We have a great need, the need to be forgiven and made right with God, and Jesus has met our need by dying on the cross for our sins. We want a good life and to live in a nice house Well, Jesus has gone to heaven to prepare a mansion for us in a new and perfect world. We long to be loved and appreciated for who we are. 
And no one can love us and appreciate us more than the one who made us and loves us and died for us. We gain everything when we choose to be servants of God. But if you're like me, that title of servant, that title of slave still doesn't feel right. And you know what? That's okay. Because look at what Jesus said to his followers, his disciples in the book of John. He said, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Jesus doesn't consider us his servants. If we are obedient to Jesus and submit to what he wants for us, which is good for us, then Jesus calls us his friends. Now, that doesn't mean that we stop being humble in our relationship with Jesus, and it doesn't mean that we are now equal with Jesus. It just means that instead of being forced to bend towards God's will, because again, God is in control and he will have happen what he wants to have happen. But instead of being forced to bend towards God's will, it means that we willingly choose to go along with and work towards what God wants. And when we do, when we do follow Jesus, we find hope in our relationship with him. So how do we work on becoming more humble? Well, it starts in your mind. You need to practice consciously choosing to let God be in control instead of trying to be in control yourself. And to do this, you need to trust. You need to believe that God wants what is best for you. If you can do that, then each decision you make, every choice that you face can be boiled down to one question. Do I believe that what God wants is what's best for me? And so should I choose to do what he wants? Or do I believe that what I want to do is what's best for me? And so I'm going to do what I want to do. And if you truly believe that God wants what's best for you, then you'll choose his way. And friends, when we choose God's way, we'll all find that God wants us to have a good life and good relationships with others. Now, this also then means that we need to be humble towards other people. But it is good for us to have good relationships with our family and our friends, our co-workers and our neighbors. And so when God asks us to be humble towards others, he's actually doing what's best for us, right? Being humble towards God leads us towards being humble towards others, which actually leads us to have good relationships, which is for our own good. And so God proves himself to be good towards us. Of course, humility also leads towards hope. When we humble ourselves and willingly go along with what God wants for us and for this world around us, and when we work towards that end, we find ourselves on the same team, friends with, and even in the same family as the God of the universe. And then, because we are under his care and protection, nothing can happen to us that he does not allow or that he does not cause, just like with anyone. But he also promises that he will work all things, all things for the good of those who love him and who have been called and join him in his purposes. So let God be in control of your life. Submit to what he wants for you. Be humble in your relationship with him. And as James, the brother of Jesus says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you love us and that you are good towards us. God, We confess that at times we lose sight of this reality. We lose sight of the fact that you want what is best for us. And because of that, we try to take control. We try to wrestle control away from you. God, would you forgive us? 
Would you also help us, give us the strength and the ability to process, even in those moments of decision-making, would you help us to think, what does God want me to do in this situation that is going to lead towards my best? God, help us to submit to you. Help us to be obedient to you. Help us to be humble in our relationship with you so that we can find our hope in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a great week and don't forget to stay humble. We'll see you next Sunday.